Well, some of you know that you have to take vitamin D when you're not getting enough sunlight, right? Is that right? I think that just like many of us need vitamin D as a supplement, I think spiritually we need vitamin G. What's vitamin G? Gratitude. You remind me of that joke about the pastor doing the children's sermon? And he describes to the children, he says, I, I want you to tell me what's brown and furry and has a tail. And this little boy raised his hand and said, well, I'm sure the answer is Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> so, G, God or gratitude, I think we need a spiritual supplement to enhance our spiritual lives. I read this in a newspaper recently about a woman who said, husband for sale, cheap, complete with hunting and fishing equipment, one pair of jeans, two shirts, boats, black lab, and 50 pounds of venison. Pretty good guy, but not home much between October and December. We'll consider a trade. Well, interestingly enough, she got a lot of response, as you would expect, but the response was not what she expected. So she wrote another ad, and it said, and I quote, retraction of husband for sale, everybody wants the dog, not the husband. <laughs> so today we're talking about gratitude, and St. Paul, even though he can be edgy at times, he's a passionate person. I always say, yeah, if you want to understand Paul, you have to understand his passion. So he says, although they knew God and experienced his goodness, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And what St. Paul is saying is that gratitude is not just a day. It is not just one day a year when we say thank you. It is a way of life. And if we don't take it seriously, we can actually experience the futility of thinking and the hardness of heart. The Psalms are full of this. Say it with me, please. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget his blessings. And why is that so important? We tend to forget. The Psalms are full of naming the blessings of God. Don't forget how good God is. Here's Psalm 105. Would you say it with me, please? Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all His wonderful acts. It's one thing to think it. It's another to say it. And then this one Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Now, in the Psalms, there is a clear distinction between thanksgiving and praise. Does anybody know what it is? You might be on jeopardy someday. Thanksgiving is rooted in naming what God has done. Praise is rooted in naming who God is. And there's a critical difference. And it's actually really important to know the distinction and to practice this, the distinction as I'll illustrate in today's sermon. So a survey was done by George Barner recently of Americans, and he basically said that we have a gratitude gap. What's a gratitude gap? It's the gap between what we believe and what we practice and he basically said, after summarizing pages and pages and pages of research, that we as Americans think gratitude is really important, but we're not very good at practicing it. He calls it the gratitude gap. So in his research, 44% of the men who were surveyed said we practice gratitude well. 56% said we don't. Women, 52% said we practice gratitude well. 48% said we don't. His point is there's a gratitude gap. 
The question of the day is, do you and I have a gratitude gap in our life? Everybody thinks that gratitude is really important and that it's a wonderful virtue for each of us to practice, but we have a hard time doing it. And if we do it, we have a hard time being consistent with it, according to George Barna. So, a second question of the day is, what does Jesus, as communicated through Luke, teach us about gratitude? Amazingly, Luke, now this is a time for interaction. It's a little warm in here, so I've got to work really hard to keep you awake. According to Luke, now Luke is what? What's his vocation? He's a physician. And there are people who say, well, I wonder if Dr. Luke really wrote the Gospel of Luke, and I'm one of those who says absolutely he did, and I'll tell you why. Because when you look at how he wrote the Gospel of Luke, he reveals what physicians reveal. Physicians care about detail. Physicians care about interrelatedness and interconnectedness. Physicians are good at looking at complexity. And that's Luke. He dives deep. He's not going to stand up in front of you and say, guess what, folks? We've got to close the gratitude gap. Let's get with it. I'm Coach Luke. I'm going to inspire you. I'm going to in do everything in my power to get you to practice gratitude. That's not how Luke approaches it. He's not the coach here. He's the doctor. And so he wants to dig deep into why we struggle to practice gratitude. Now see, you're already going to sleep on me. I told you it's a little warm in here. I can see that glaze that comes over your eyes here. So let's allow Jesus through Luke to teach us how to live a life of gratitude not just once a year, but every moment of every day. Now, guess where Dr. Luke begins? Well, it's reflected. Those of you who come from the Presbyterian background, you will know that in the Westminster Confession, there's a catechism. And the catechism is a teaching. It's a systematic way of talking about the faith. And the first question in the catechism, read it with me, please. I've got to keep you awake. What is the chief end of man? What's the response? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And generally speaking, we've put the emphasis on the first half to the neglect of the second. We have done a good job of emphasizing glorifying God. We've not done as good a job of teaching the importance of enjoying God. Well, Dr. Luke's all over it because Dr. Luke is passionate about life. Zoe. People ask me all the time, well, why is it that you like Luke more than the other Gospels? It's because Luke approaches the gospel life, the good news life, the life that is rooted in that which is good and wonderful. Luke approaches it with this idea that God calls us to life now, not just when we die. You've heard from this pulpit probably hundreds of times. The goal of the Christian life is not just to get people into heaven when they die, it's to get heaven into people while they live and that's Luke's passion. So if we want to talk about a life of gratitude, we have to begin where Luke begins. And let me just tell you, this week, as I was studying this, I came to a realization that I have not known in 30 plus years of ministry. And that's the beauty of Scripture. It's new, it's fresh. I did not see this connection. You want to know what this connection is? So with Dr. Luke responding to the question, how can I live a life of gratitude? Guess where he begins? I did not expect this. I did not see this. I had no idea that he was so clearly communicating the importance of this. It begins with 
forgiveness. What? So I'm going to read this for you just because I'm going to have to do it quickly. Jesus said to his disciples, Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. And then he has these hard sayings about it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck, and it's like, okay, Jesus, we get the point. This is kind of going over the top here. Now, Luke is not one to mince words. We know that about the good doctors that we go to. They tell it like it is, gently, but they tell it like it is. If you've got a problem, you don't want a doctor prancing around the issue, right? You want somebody that's going to say, this is a problem. Luke very carefully reflects Dr. Jesus and Dr. Luke have gotten their heads together and they're communicating that gratitude is rooted in forgiveness. Now, guess what I have never seen before? I've never connected gratitude and forgiveness, really. But that's not really what blew my socks off. The apostle said to the Lord, well, increase our faith. What? I have never, and I can tell you never, I have never preached a sermon before that says that forgiveness is so incredibly hard and so incredibly challenging that if you want to learn forgiveness, you've got to grow your faith. I've never preached that. But Dr. Luke does. And faith, as Dr. Luke defines it, is a belief in a power greater than ourselves to do what we cannot do on our own. Now this is so profound. At least it is to me, and I pray that it is for you. So the disciples said, well, increase our faith. This whole forgiveness thing is beyond what we can handle. And the Lord replied, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, what I love about Jesus is that there is nothing accidental about his expression. Everything is intentional. And why did he pick a mulberry tree? He could have picked any tree. Why did he pick a mulberry tree when talking about Forgiveness, because do you realize that the root system of a mulberry tree is the most complex? And that the ancient rabbis said that it would take 600 years of intentional unwrapping and unraveling of the roots of a single tree because they are so complex and so integrally related to one another that it's the point is forgiveness is not easy. And I have to confess, sometimes we, we make forgiveness sound like, well, just, Stephen, just forgive and get over it. We, we've cheapened it. We, we've made it into something that, well, just do it. Rather than Jesus is saying it's very complex and it's very difficult and it's very challenging just like the root system of the mulberry tree. But you can't do it on your own. So what's the size of a mulberry bush? Doesn't matter. The root system is massive. What's the size of a mustard seed? Tiny. I was going to bring some that I have, but... Jay, I decided that would not be good for me to do that because they're very difficult to hold. They're so small. And what is Jesus' point? To live a life of forgiveness is the foundation upon which gratitude is built. And as Jim preached a couple of weeks ago, I hope that you'll go on YouTube and listen to that sermon because I think he said it very well. 
And he quoted this Lutheran professor in Minneapolis who says that in the kingdom of God, there is not any room for won't when it comes to forgiveness, but there's a lot of room for can't. And that's Jesus' point here. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own strength or on our own power, but with God's help, we can. Now, what's a billion times zero? What's a trillion times zero? So the other day, this father called and said that his daughter, who's in her 30s, is having a hard time getting her life together. So he said, would you come to our home and sit with me and my daughter and, and talk to us about her spiritual life? So I did. Long story made short, she's in this place where she's expecting God to do all the work. And she's adopted this passive nature of, well, I'm just going to sit back and let God do what God does. And if God doesn't do it, then it's not going to happen. And I said to her, take the greatest amount of power in this world and you multiply it by zero, what do you get? That's Jesus' point. The call to forgiveness apart from the power of God. We can't do it. But the power of God without our intentional effort Nothing happens. There's some more there, but we've got to move on for the sake of time. So this idea of forgiving God and forgiving others and forgiving ourselves, and, and some of you might be shocked that I put up there forgiving God. There are a lot of people who say, when I look at this world and how God chooses to run this universe, if I were on the throne, I'd do it differently. You might be surprised how often I hear that. And I always say, well, guess what? You're not on the throne. I'm not on the throne. God is. You may have to forgive God for not making you God. You might have to forgive God for not making this universe run like you want it to run. This whole act of forgiveness is beyond us, and yet it's essential if we're going to live a life of gratitude, which is what then Dr. Luke talks about and he uses this example of ten lepers and here's the thing I want you to notice he makes this connection not only faith as believing that God is able to do what we can't but he also says faith is acting as if act as if you're forgiven and you'll forgive act as if you forgive and you'll feel forgiven. Act as if you've been healed and you will notice that you are. And you'll be grateful. Now, Dr. Luke is making a clear distinction between healing and wellness. Because ten were healed, but only one was made well. Because only one practiced gratitude. And gratitude is essential for wholeness, for wellness. But it's not essential for curing. See, Dr. Luke is saying, if you want to be a person of gratitude who practices gratitude consistently, it's rooted in knowing that you're forgiven, and therefore you can forgive. It's rooted in this idea that gratitude is essential for my well-being. And because he's a doctor, he's concerned about our well-being. How many of you have heard of Brene Brown? I'm going to jump ahead through this. Brene Brown is this sociologist in Houston. And she's done major research on gratitude. I'm going to ask her to do research on what Dr. Luke is showing us.
because she's done a piece of it, not the whole of it. Look at the screen. She says, after 11,000 data points, she came to this conclusion. It is not our joy that makes us grateful. It's gratitude that makes us joyful. Her research shows that a person who struggles with gratitude is a person who will struggle to be joyful. And what I want to invite her to research is a person who struggles to forgive is a person who's going to struggle to be grateful. And that person is going to struggle to be joyful. She says, gratitude is not an attitude. That's a misnomer. Because if we live by the dictum of gratitude is an attitude, guess what? It's momentary. If it's to be a way of life, it requires action. And it takes a lot of practice. So, Brene Brown, in her home, every evening, every meal, they name their blessings. And based on her research, everybody in her home has a gratitude journal. And they, because of her research, discovered that there's something magical about seven minutes. Less than seven minutes, we just touch the surface. But if we discipline ourselves, we take out our phones, and we set the timer for seven minutes, I'm going to, for seven minutes, name every blessing. To do that every day, she says, the research proves, deepens our level of gratitude. And then she says the third most important thing that the research showed is that those who are joyful are people who are practicing gratitude and they're people who intentionally find ways to show appreciation. Three people every day, she says either in a note, either in person, but people who are grateful are people who are joyful and they're people who show appreciation. She also says that we have to notice the blessings that we take for granted. So Meredith and I in our home during this cold spell woke up one morning to our home being 60 degrees the furnace decided not to work. Now, I don't know about you, but I take things like that for granted. I take water for granted. I take heat for granted. I take lights for granted. Brene Brown says, you need to remember 75% of the world lacks water, heat, cooling, or electricity all the time. And then the fifth thing, and this is all based on her research. She says, in every situation, look for the good and name it. It's not just enough to say in your own mind, well, that's a good thing that has come out of that, not so good thing. But you've got to declare it. You've got to name it. Like the psalmist says, you've got to tell it. Now, where does this all lead? To the third component, which is Praise. Now hear this, I've got to, I'm over my time, so I've got to say this quickly. In this third part of Dr. Luke's prescription for a life of gratitude rooted in forgiveness, it's a sandwich. The two slices that hold gratitude, forgiveness and praise. And you know what Dr. Luke says? You'll have to trust me and you can go read this. If you and I have a distorted notion of who God is, then we'll struggle with forgiveness and we'll struggle with gratitude. Because thanksgiving is based on what God has done. Praise is rooted in giving Praise to God for who God is. So let me close by telling you this story. 
We'll find it here. St. Ignatius of Loyola, he's one of my heroes of the faith, and he struggled with what we call scrupulosity. Does anybody know what scrupulosity is? If you have small pebbles, they're scruples. Scrupulosity. He was so obsessed with his sinfulness that he tried everything. He said, I tried everything to get rid of my guilt and shame. I contemplated suicide. And then there's a lot of other things that he tried for several years. And hear this. I threw myself on God's mercy and finally found peace. He threw himself on God's mercy. Who God is. And then he found peace. If you believe that God is for you rather than against you, if you believe that God is wrathful rather than loving, if you believe that God is getting even rather than God is working for our good, is it any wonder people struggle with forgiveness and therefore struggle with gratitude? I promise I'll tell this story quickly. Leo Tolstoy, the repentant sinner. I love this story because it illustrates powerfully what Dr. Luke is saying. If you and I do not know who God is, we cannot rightly praise God. And in the New Testament, I think this is the next slide, there are three nouns used for God. Only three. And if our notions of God don't fit this, who's right? Are you all with me? Life, light, and love. So if you think of God as anything other than that, you have to decide, is the New Testament right or am I right? And we'll never be able to praise God for who God is as long as we don't have a right understanding of who God is. That God is life and God is light and God is love. Therefore, I close with this. Leo Tolstoy, the repentant sinner. Have you read his short story? This man who is overcome by his sinfulness dies and goes to heaven and there's St. Peter. And St. Peter says to him, you can't come in. You're too bad of a person. And he says, well, St. Peter, I don't want to play this little game with you, but you denied the Lord. I think that's pretty bad. He says, well, I'm in, but you're not because you're too bad. Well, the next one to appear is King David. King David says, you're too bad of a man. You can't come in. He says, well, I don't want to have to play this game with you, King David, but you committed adultery and you committed murder. How come you're in and I'm not? He says, well, those are bad things, but guess what? You're worse. What you did is worse than what I did. I'm in, you're out. So he goes to St. John. St. John's the beloved disciple. St. John is the one who taught about God's love and God's light and God's life. And he said, these other two tell me I'm too bad. He said, God is love. God is light. God is life. Come in. Do you hear, do you see the brilliance of what Jesus is teaching through Dr. Luke? Do you and I really want a life of gratitude more than an attitude that's occasional but a way of life that's consistent? It's rooted in forgiveness and it's enveloped by 
praise. What's God saying to us today? Let's have a time of silent prayer, shall we?